I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Today we're honored to welcome Ohio Governor and former 2016 Republican presidential candidate John Kasich, a longtime congressman, chairman of the Budget Committee, and member of the Armed Services Committee. Kasich was the chief architect of the 1990s deficit-ending deal that ushered into the new millennium a clean fiscal bill of health for the nation. Today, of course, Kasich is better known as the two-term governor of Ohio who's presided over recovery from the Great Recession, a critic of Donald Trump's hateful rhetoric, nativism, protectionism, and personal conduct unbecoming of President of the United States that have debased the highest office in the land. Welcome, Governor. Pleasure to see you again. Good to be with you. We have a saying on this program at the end, keep an open mind, but I've added to it now, keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> have the Republican Party's brains splattered on the floor away from TR and Lincoln and the saints of Republicans? Well, I, I think you're seeing a, it's a worldwide phenomenon now that uh, we see, and it's, um, I think the fact that uh, there's a number of people who just feel as though uh, no one gets them, no one cares about them. Now, the Republican Party is a little bit different. There are those people who kind of joined the party and supported Trump, and then there are your traditional Republicans. But, you know, we become pretty much tribal in terms of our politics. So if you're a Democrat, you go Democrat. If you're a Republican, you go rep Republican. But we're starting to see somewhat of a breakdown of that, where you're seeing, um, at least in the midterm election, Republicans who either stayed at home or Republicans who actually voted for a Democrat candidate, not, maybe not so much because they... They liked the Democrat, but it was a way for them to register a protest vote against the, you know, the negative mood of the country. Uh, but you look all over the world, and there's this rise of populism. And it's um, if you even look in France right now, and you see the, uh, the yellow vests. And that is about, hey, all you folks over here, the establishment, rich people, uh, you, know, you don't care about us. We're out here. We're struggling to make a living. And... Um, People need to talk to them, and they need to not just talk to them, but show that the, that they're a very important part of our of our culture. So, what, kind of what you know, in a funny sort of way, it's what we did in Ohio, where Republicans did quite well. I mean, in in Illinois, they lost everything. Wisconsin, they were beaten bad. Uh, same in Michigan, Pennsylvania, but in Ohio, virtually all the Republicans won. And I attach that largely to the fact that the state is doing better, but I, maybe as important is that no one was left behind. So if you're concerned about the environment, you have a place with us. If you're concerned about a son or a daughter who has aut autism, we're, we're involved. If you have somebody who's dis you know, disabled, if you have somebody who's mentally ill or drug addicted, or a member of the minority community, there's a space for you, for everybody. And so it was a top to, to down, uh, I'm sorry, top to down uh, sort of implementation of policy that left no one behind. I think that's what people are hungering for today. They, they are just not so sure anybody really cares about them. So I think you're saying that the Republican Party can be saved, potentially. And I have pushed back in my own state yeah. from members of the legislature. But if you want to be successful as a party, you can't be successful when you don't attract young people, women, minorities. <laughs> you know, how, how are you going to win? So. And, and it's not about winning. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a boring thing for me. Yeah. The issue is your policies. Are they inclusive? Are they hopeful? Are they uplifting? Because if they're not, then, and if they're narrow, if they're divisive, and, you know, the party has been kind of lurching that way, and that's not healthy or good. Now, can they change? I don't know. I, there's stories that say that they don't even want to take a look at why they had such a terrible midterm. But, you know, I do my thing and spread my message, and we'll see what happens. What would a corrective course look like to you? If, if there is an infection in the, in the party, how do well, you... Well, first of all, you know, let's think, let's realize, uh, Alex, that, you know, in our country, historically, change doesn't come from the top down. Change comes from the bottom up. So if you think about civil rights, even the Kennedys ran away from it. It's too hot politically for them. It took... It took uh, the churches, uh, both in the South, of course, the rise of Martin Luther King, people in the North, to bring about a pressure that drove change from the bottom up. Same was true in ending the Vietnam War. The same is true in women's suffrage. So I think that we have to realize that change emanates with us so that we're important, that we're valuable. I just read a story the other day about people now who have 
are kind of minor shareholders in some of these tech companies now. They're beginning to file things with the boards. They're beginning to realize, hey, I have a say. So there is a, there is a, a yearning for people to really to be impactful. Um, but a party that would say, it's just take a couple issues, you know, border separation, family separation at the border. Bad idea, terrible idea, horrible idea. Uh, the need to control border, of course, you can't just let people walk in, but the policies now and the proposals, the programs now are really failing. Trade, you know, of course we want free trade, but to get into trade wars and, and just to, you know, to, to actually be, declare yourself as the tariff president, I don't think that's a very smart thing either. Debt, we got $21 trillion debt. You know, the Republican Party traditionally worries about, about debt. So, uh, I mean, there's a number of things we can do, but most important is the mood, the mood that a president or a leader can project because, and the mood has to be sincere, it can't be phony. And that mood is one of, hey, if you've got a problem, we wanna help you. Uh, if you have a problem, we'll figure out a way to give you a lift. That's, I think, what we need to do. If you're a small business person, we're not gonna ignore you, have you go bankrupt. If you're wealthy, we're not going to punish you, but there is an element of, of, of equality, income equality that, or inequality that matters. I mean, those are the things that I think that both parties have to think about. I'm not sure the Democrats are thinking, of, I think they've become, in too many cases, extreme. So what do you think is on the mind of the New Hampshire voter? We were both there. You were running, and I was based at Franklin. Just what I said. I mean, that's so what's on you, their mind. Just those what I issues said. are on their mind. What about my job? What about my kid's job? What about my wages? What about health care? You were part of, in the House, Ira Shapiro wrote a book, The Last Great Senate. It was about how bipartisanship and uh, folks coming together with Kennedy and Dole, Baker, a whole host of people in the, on the Senate side who were committed to working through problems for the betterment of the country. Um, you, I think there, there was a lot of partisanship back then, too, but there were moments in time which people could rise to a higher purpose, and, and I think that's and what we missed. And you and Governor Hickenlooper have talked about rising to that. Well, look, I was in the purpose. House when we rose to a yeah. higher level. We got the budget balance. We paid down debt. I mean, it, it's a remarkable achievement. We ended the production of a very expensive B-2 bomber at a much uh, smaller number than what was originally thought of. That was another coalition. Uh, there are a lot of coalitions. Um, what we do about corporate welfare, uh, what we do about defense reform. I mean, there was a lot of things like that. And there are moments in time when people would rise, but it doesn't seem to happen as much. And so in order to be, have a meaningful time in public life, uh, it isn't about you know, checking in with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party and picking up their talking points. It's really about bringing, uh, working to bring about a better life for uh, people that you represent. And uh, so that's, that's the way it should be. If you leave there and you haven't done that, then I don't know what you think about. I mean, do you think that I represented a narrow group, whether it was left or right? I mean, to me, that's, that's a that is not a meaningful participation. I'm very proud of the time I sp I've spent in government, but I didn't do it from the basis of uh, you know partisanship. It was just never my nature. And the fact that uh, I have no regrets and I feel very good about some of the really significant accomplishments that occurred while I was involved with some of these issues. And given the extremities, you know, the, the real extreme nature of the base on the primary and caucus side, is there a scenario you imagine where y you can resonate and and really overcome? You mean that, me? Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Don't have the answer to that Com right now. If you combine your interests, you know, your interest on the House side was fiscal discipline, in part, right? Well, there were there was more. You, it was were, I was a reformer from the you, minute I got there. I mean, were, but it uh, wasn't just fiscal discipline. It was also fairness from the standpoint of. Uh, of the business of passing out Ben of corporate welfare. It was, I was a defense reformer, strong defense, but reform. I mean, uh, I was involved in a lot of different uh, issues down there. And uh, so don't, I can't be put into one little box, but I'm most known for, for my, uh, sure. my fiscal uh, activism. As governor, you said to your state um, that healthcare is important. You wanted to expand access to healthcare. Yeah. Um, is, you know, folks are, are really, I think, increasingly receptive you to know, a let message. Me, let, let me, let me yeah, just go, let me go back to, to, to something you asked, and that's the question of can you break through. When people are on the extremes, it's pretty hard to break through. But I don't believe that's where most people are. I think most people exist in the middle. 
Now, if you're thinking about primaries or caucuses and all that, that's a whole different breed. Right. But do I think that most people want to exist on the right or on the left, that they want to have anxiety and, and, and dysfunction? Of course they don't. Uh, hung to their ideology, come, come thick or thin. But that's, I don't think that's where most people are. Most people just want to see government do its job and, and stop messing around. And uh, I think there are increasing numbers of people that don't even want to watch the news anymore because it's just too boring for them. Like, and you know why? Because it doesn't affect their life every day. When you think about how much impact a president has on your life day to day, or any leader day to day, of course there are times uh, you know, where you can find examples where it is a day to day function, but in most times it doesn't affect you. What affects you? Your family, your friends, your job, and, and instead of people worrying so much about these folks who are up here, why don't we worry about ourselves and our neighbor and our friends and our community and our schools and our towns? That, that's where we should be really bringing the force of who we are to bring about change and peace and a better life for everyone. You won the nomination in your state. You won Ohio. Yeah. Sherrod Brown won Ohio most recently. Um, and you have a successor who's a Republican, DeWine. Um, what does that tell you? Uh, because you, even though you come from different quarters, uh, you and Senator Brown right now represent a kind of uh, philosophy towards politics that is uplifting, constructive, positive in people's lives. The majority of the folks in the White House are not. There's a lot of native. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that, no. about that assumption. No, I mean, I, well, let me, let me put it to you this way. Can't you, and, you, yeah. and Senator Brown, you and yeah. Senator Brown both want to honor the dignity of work. I mean, you just talked about yeah. it. You want to, sure. So the, the interesting thing about your history is that you combined an interest in wanting look, to look, have I, sound I, look, fiscal... I, look, no, let me just finish no, no, no. I like yeah. Sherrod Brown, but he's very liberal. He's, let me just finish. He, let me just finish. He doesn't care about balanced budgets. But let me finish. You do, though. But yeah, you I simultaneously do. expanded... Medicaid. Access to, access yeah. to healthcare. But that was so, a smart decision. Right. But this is what I want to get at. Okay. Because I've had All liberals right. here, conservatives here, and, and this has been on my mind, which is, uh, was in Wyoming not so long ago, spoke with the state legislator who uh, is conservative, Republican, retired, and he is seeing within the Republican establishment, the voters want universal health care. And, and it's actually something that Trump campaigned on. And I'm wondering from your perspective, uh, if you would support the idea of uh, honoring people's basic human right to health care if they're going to contribute to the nation, a kind of Kennedy-esque call that if you're going to do for your country, your country is going to have your back. Uh, and Democrats, this is a third rail for them, the idea of a volunteer requirement or a work requirement. But if we are going to pursue universal care, Medicare for all or whatever. I, I'm not how, for Medicare for all. That's a big government program that will so, stifle so how do you innovation. Honor, how do you honor well, the we, dignity we, of work? Because okay, we, we right now in Ohio have, I don't know, maybe the lowest uninsured rate in our history. You know, we expanded Medicaid. Uh, we need to make it easier for small businesses to group together and individuals to become part of that to be able to buy insurance at more affordable prices. Mm -hmm. But we need a fundamental reform of health care. It's not sustainable. What does that look like? The fundamental reform. The fundamental reform would involve, first of all, everybody should be able to get it. There should be no denial for pre-existing conditions. I don't like the idea of having lifetime limits. We need to have a system that pays for performance. I mean, whenever you go to see the doctor, did you ever ask your doctor what things cost? I'll bet you never did. Okay, so you're not, unlike, you're not likely to do that. We need to pay for performance. Are you getting quality? Are you getting what you're in there to get? That's the long-term initiative. To, to try to make sure that we provide the best health care at the lowest possible price. But if there's no sense of a marketplace, if there's no sense of a cost, it's pretty hard to guarantee that. And that's a long road to pay for performance. That's where we need to be. In the meantime, of course, in my state, we expanded Medicaid. Uh, it's, it's something that fits in with our fiscal policies because we don't want to bankrupt the state and drive jobs out. So, you know, what we've done is to, is to we've got, a, you know, a, employers who are, uh, self-insured and they, they cover their people. We need to do a better job of getting small businesses to be able to group together. And, um, and Has the tax reform helped or hurt tax Ohio? Reform. Has the legislation that passed, the, the, the reform, the corporate reform, uh, the tax legislation that passed last year, yeah. has that helped or hurt Ohio? Well, I mean... The Republican legislation. Well, it helped businesses, you know, particularly big companies, to be able to have a lower tax rate. That's good. Uh, but most big companies provide pretty comprehensive health care. 
The biggest change in our state to deal with the problems of the mentally ill, the drug addicted, uh, the working poor was the expansion of Medicaid. And, uh, but we also need a, a big reform of Medicaid. We need a significant reform of Medicare. Uh, these things are all achievable if you're creative and you think about these things in a different way. We took the growth of Medicaid from, I don't know, eight or nine percent down to three or four percent, and uh, we cover more people. It's affordable. And so, you know, we were creative in the way we did it, which caused us or forced us to take a look at the way we had been providing uh, certain programs and to make difficult reforms, but ultimately serve the customer, not the special interest groups. Where do we go next? If you were to, I know it's been speculated about, but Governor, Governor Hickenlooper may or may not run for president, but regardless of that noise, right? Just the idea of what Democrats are gonna listen to, to a Republican today with the House back in Democratic control now, where is there any possibility for bipartisanship well, I mean, there's, the, the, the possibility is there. It's just a matter of whether the leaders want to engage in that. I mean, it's not that difficult. You know, if, if I were there, I would say, look, we need to start working on something on the, on the debt. The debt is so high, $21 trillion. Uh, We need to start thinking, if we're going to spend more money on the, the Department of Defense, what should it look like? Uh, I mean, these are great opportunities for, uh, oh, how do we reform Medicaid? How do we do that? Hickenlooper and I had a plan, for example, not that our plan should be carved in stone, but is this an opportunity for particularly your younger members to be able to, to get together with people of the other party? Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with them on everything. I work with a lot of people. I disagree with 90 percent. But that 10 percent that I could agree upon was, were things that were, you know, interesting and exciting and things we could work together. And then you get called the odd couple because you're working with somebody who's philosophically different. But there's always areas in which we can reach agreement, and it's fun. It's fun to work on reform programs and, and strengthen the country. The most important area... It doesn't even matter, by the yeah. way, whether you win right out of the, out sure. the box. I mean, it took me 10 years of writing budgets against a Republican president, including a Republican president, to ultimately get to 97. It just takes time. It takes time to reform the Pentagon. It's very hard. But you put your time in, you build a coalition, and over time you can win. Are you most concerned about human decency, though, the, the sort of indecency that we've seen out of this president just as a, as a society? What I'm, what I'm concerned about is that we all are our brother's keeper. You know, when you think about the two greatest commandments, one, love God and love your neighbor, uh, as you would want your neighbor to love you. That's not, you know, love in the traditional sense. It's look out for your neighbor yeah. the same way you would want your neighbor to look out for you. And, uh, and a sense in our country that we matter, that each of us matter, that each of us are unique, that each of us have certain gifts that can be used to help heal part of the world. Uh, I don't spend my time wringing my hands. I spend my time spending a different message, which is you matter. Come on, s figure out what you can do. I don't like the negative or the divisiveness. That's why I didn't support Trump for president. And, have, and I'm, I don't like to, I'm not a critic of Donald Trump. I just see things I don't like and I say it. And if there's something I like, I'll say it. You know, it's just, I, I'm not into that kind of uh, positioning myself or whatever. I, I, I've been around too long. My job is to be, try to be a positive and constructive influence on where we need to go and call out those things that I think are just not right in terms of what, uh, how I feel about America. But at a certain point, those moral lapses are going to stain us in a way that is irreversible, right? I mean, no, I don't believe anything's really irreversible. I, I don't believe that. So this is maybe an aberration. If you go... Well, wait, wait, wait. First of all, most people aren't engaged in all this. Most people just live their lives. They're not like sitting there all the time we're, I'm not sure where you're coming from on that. Coming from this is supposed to be like a conversation, can, can, so I'm I'm questioning you too. Yeah, please do. What I'm, I, I'm talking about I, a, the moral, yeah, the moral degradation of of, of living with Donald yeah. Trump. I'm I, just don't I don't I don't worry about moral degradation. De degradation. The people who the people I'm worried a lot of about who the want to support you in, in, in yeah. you know, potential primary or people who think that the Republican Party's brains are splattered no, on the floor oh, because well, they, they haven't retained look, the kind of there's a lot of moral values. I had a lady come to me, up to me at the airport the other day. She says, I want to build a wall, okay? I said, okay, fine, um, but we need to control the border. I mean, does that mean we'd have to have a wall everywhere? Because we do have to control the border. But we also don't want to have family separation. She says, yeah, you're right about that. She says, I'm not for gun control. 
This is all in one conversation. I said, well, let's say that somebody in your family is unstable for some reason or somebody in the workplace is unstable. You go to a judge and say that person could pose harm to somebody. Would you, would you before that? She said, well, absolutely. Why don't we do that? See, in other words, I think when you dig deep down deeper, if you could have a conversation with all those people yeah. and let them move away from the tribal aspects of where they are or only to absorb that that they agree with, people are, are very open to this stuff. It's just hard to get to them. Uh, it's hard to be able to have an individual conversation with everybody. But I don't want to... You've inspired many of them. Well, I mean, that's people. good. Then I'm, I'm doing my job. Yeah, I mean... I'm, I mean, I'm talking That's about my perspective. My perspective is that... You know, speaking as an old fogey millennial, yeah. one of the few... Yeah, you are all getting older. Yeah. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you don't just chime in. You assert an authority when it comes to calling out things that virtually everyone else in your party... Well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not calling the woman out. I'm just saying, hey, did you ever think yeah. about this? No, I'm not. I'm talking about right. the man. I'm talking about Trump, calling him out. No, oh. well, the lady, you're... you're oh, yeah, firing. if I see him do something <laughs> that I think is inappropriate, I'm, I'm going to yeah. say I don't like it. But and, what, and what uh, is Ohio? It creates a bad mood. We, See, remember what I was saying? Yeah. A president doesn't necessarily, on a day-to-day, -day, uh, in most cases, on a day-to-day -day, uh, situation, right. affect that much, except maybe our mood. And when the mood is negative, 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 sure. then people get sour. Well, that's not, that's not a good place to live. So yeah. I'd like to see, hey, I know you have a problem, but let's figure out how to fix it. Right. Let's, let's right. go up, up, well, that, up, not down, down, down. Sure. You know? That problem solving or stick to itiveness, I think we hosted Mayor Nan Whaley here, um, and she exhibited that same spirit, the spirit of wanting to get something done on behalf of folks. You know. Work hard. Good. And uh, what is the most lasting lesson f from your governorship? Uh, now you've care about people, you know. But don't you can't you can't manufacture caring, right? Okay. You, you, it's not like I got I'm gonna today. I'm gonna take a care pill. It's it's the ability to put yourself in in anybody's situation, to think, okay, what if I were there? What if I didn't have health care? What if I couldn't get a job? What if I had a job and I didn't make much money? What about if, you know, if my kid is really struggling? You know, these are heartbreaking things. And so the ability, what, if I, what if I were a small business person, I couldn't figure out how to make payroll? Um, or even if I was a big business person and I, was, I now was suffering a lot of attacks, okay? You think about that and you put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And when you do that, it makes you a better person. No, I do that all the time. Of course I don't. You know, we all live at a very, very fast pace. But if we slow down and actually think about the challenges somebody else has, it, it improves our ability to show compassion. It improves our ability to be sort of dedicated to solving, to solving a problem. You know, I was at um, breakfast the other day uh, in my hometown, and Dad came in with two kids, twins, both autistic. And, you know, he loves those kids, but you could see the challenges that he had with these boys. And I said to the, one of the people serving the meal, uh, could you have Dad come over? So Dad came over. I said, hey, you getting the help you need? Are we helping you? If we're not, tell me. Now, that's what I will miss about being a governor is that I can, like, let's go help that guy. And that's, that makes you feel really good. But just to put yourself there, uh, you know, I've got two incredible daughters and we've been blessed and I look at people that have more challenges and it, it, it makes me think about their lives more and what can I do to, to, to help them in their life you know but it's not just the governor it's like their neighbors it's their friends it's their family we're all in the rowboat together all in the rowboat together I was talking to somebody else in my administration about what if you were, I, let me give you an example. I met these two wonderful people. I think they're from Houston in an airport. I meet a lot of people in an airport. And they had a son that was suffer, suffering very serious illness. They were worried about they were going to hit the lifetime limit. So if they hit the lifetime limit on health care, giving their kids some help, where do they go? What do they have to sell their house, their car? I mean, that, that's, I think to some degree, that's where the Republicans have missed it. Um, it's that sometimes they have not been stopping to think about somebody else's life and what it means. You know, somebody at the border who's running because they've been, they've been harassed or threatened in their own, in their own community. Um, 
Now, the Democrats, you know, with some of their wild, you know, ice is like the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, I mean that, that stuff is just way out there. Or Medicare for all. Let's just, what does that cost? How many trillion? I mean, it, it bankrupt the country. So I think what we have to do, for me, focus on that middle. Don't worry about these extremes. I mean, I listen to them, but the, the ocean of people, it, it rests in the middle of our country. Governor. Is that it? The humanitarian middle. Thank you for your time today, Governor. All right, thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter at Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, The Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.